Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School as this is prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is lesson number two in a new series entitled Life Everlasting on Death. What? Life Everlasting? So you start with death? <laughs> dying in the future hope. Death, dying in the future hope. Life Everlasting. And this lesson number two is entitled Death in a Sinful World. It's the lesson for October 8th of 2022. As usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have come to talk about one of the major challenges in understanding many scriptures, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Help us as we talk about them today that we may understand your word more clearly and understand exactly what you want us to know from these passages is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Numerous passages in Scripture, there are many, just to mention a few, John 1, 1 to 3 and 10, Colossians 1, 16, and Hebrews 2 and 2, those are some of the most prominent ones, make it very clear that the Father, in cooperation with the Son, created everything. We do not know exactly what the time sequence was for all for time sequence for all of that was. However, we do know this: when God the Father conferred special honor on Christ and announced that they, together, would create this world, Lucifer was envious and jealous of Jesus Christ. And that's from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume One, written in 1870 or published in 1870 by Ellen White also found in several other books. So immediately, Lucifer is attempting to plot against God. So now some questions that I'd like you to think about and we'll talk about here. Are we certain that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit created everything in our universe? Do we believe that only God has creative power? And one of the interesting aspects of that, who I would be happy to have you comment on, is um, we just sent up a satellite about, what, six months ago? And it's out over, way out over there somewhere, millions of miles away. And <clears throat> um, this was supposed to show us back to the Big Bang. And what's the Big Bang? The start Where? of the whole thing. Supposed to be the beginning of all things, all where everything exploded <laughs> from one Big Bang. And so, of course, they've got this new thing with new technology and so forth. And so they're going to focus a place where there's no other stars in the way, there's no galaxies in the way. This is an, a blank spot. So we're going to see back somewhere way back there when something happened a long time ago. And when they, po po when they pointed the, the new grand new telescope there, what do you think they saw? Lots. A whole bunch of galaxies and more stars and so forth. They didn't even know what were there. So, um, I don't know, I guess we're going to have to have another satellite here in uh, 20 years that will go beyond this one. Didn't the Hubble do something similar? Yeah. That's and now we're, now we're going to the next step. Yeah. Uh, this is the one that goes beyond that. So what do you think? Is it, is it really true that only God can create? Yes. Yes. Shall we take a vote? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Um, why do you think that is? It's the source of the, all the energy. Mm -hmm. You know, what I, I have suggested was this, and we ta I've talked about this as in group, with other groups in the past. We know how to break down a little bit of matter and turn it into energy. And when we do that, we create atomic weapons, nuclear bombs, hydrogen bombs, etc. We just create a tiny little, we, we destroy a tiny little bit of mass and turn it into energy. And if you ever studied the physics, the E equals MC squared, you know it takes just a little tiny bit of mass to make an awful lot of energy. Well, guess who can take his energy and squish it down into mass? And apparently he has an awful lot of energy. He has an awful lot of energy. Think of how much mass he has created. I don't know whether one day he'll be able to explain to us how he does that. I'm not sure. Well, the Bible suggests that the ways that we know who's the real God is, who can create out of nothing, who can predict the future far in advance, 
and you know, those are the main things. Yeah, and certain types of miracles are considered to be miracles proof of divinity. Are, they can be faked. Yeah, some can. Do we believe, and this is the next big question in, in our study here, do we believe that God has given all his created beings the freedom to choose to follow him or to rebel against him? If so, was that a good idea? Yes. He has given us that freedom. It's only with freedom that we can truly love. Mm -hmm. And love is the basis of God's government. Okay. So you're saying that the freedom is necessary for love, and love is the basis of God's government, so he chooses to do that, even as we suggested last week, at some risk. Yep. Is that correct? Okay. Jim? From the beginning, excuse me, from the writings of Ellen White, <clears throat> Satan was envious and jealous of Jesus Christ. Yet when all the angels bowed to Jesus to acknowledge his supremacy and high authority and rightful rule, Satan bowed with them, but his heart was filled with envy and hatred. Christ had been taken into the special counsel of God in regard to his plans, while Satan was unacquainted with them. He did not understand neither was he permitted to know the purposes of God, but Christ was acknowledged sovereign of heaven, his power and authority to be the same as that of God himself. Satan thought he was himself a, f a favorite in heaven among the angels. He had been highly exalted. This, But this did not call forth from him gratitude and praise to his creator. He aspired to the heights of God himself. He glor gloried in his loftiness. He knew that he was honored by the angels. He had a special mission to execute. He had been near the Creator, and the ceaseless beams of glorious light enshrouded the eternal God and shone especially upon him. Satan th thought how angels had obeyed his command was pleasurable alacrity, with pleasurable alacrity. Were not his garments of light and beautiful? Why should Christ thus be honored before himself? Ellen White, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 18. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to, 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 to make some assumptions for right now. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Do you think Ellen White was shown in vision? I mean, we're talking about Satan's thoughts here. Who could possibly reveal Satan's thoughts? God himself. Only God. Only. Mm -hmm. Do you think the angels can read our thoughts? Angels cannot read our thoughts. Students of uh, human nature, but I don't think they... Yeah, they can guess. Just like we can see. We can, we, if it was enough experience, you can predict fairly closely what somebody will do. But yeah. uh, Well, try now to imagine, given that information, the condition of and this, of course, this is after I'll Revelation. On that first. Yeah. So, do you think that God gave Ellen White the ability to read those thoughts for a time, or did he play back and say, "This is what Satan was actually thinking at that time"? I th I think the only way that that's possible is that for God made he she, he revealed to Ellen White what he wanted her to know. So he, uh, he said, "This is what." Satan was thinking, Lucifer was thinking at this time. Well, or to, <clears throat> something to that effect. Yeah, he either said it to her or he could have actually allowed her to see it happen. I mean, maybe in this case of his thoughts, not obviously, but other times, when, as we're going to see, certain things took place in heaven, the war in heaven, etc. I think she probably saw that in some kind of form. Other prophets we know, I mean, think of the visions that Daniel saw. And John. Yeah, and John, and I mean, yeah. I mean, who, who else has written on this subject besides the few of the prophets and uh, Paul? Yeah. Very few have had any insights into yeah. that. And this seems to be perfectly logical. Yeah. <clears throat> well, think of the condition of Satan and his angels right after they were cast out of heaven. I mean, what are we going to eat? Where are we going to live? Do they need to eat? Do they well, need to? He added that. 
Because <laughs> <laughs> they need to live somewhere. Revelation 12 suggests that they were cast down to this earth. We do not know if that was because they chose to come to this earth or whether that was God's plan. But it is clear that when Satan discovered that God was creating a new group of individuals on this earth, Satan determined to attack them. That's pretty clear from Revelation 12. It is obvious that Satan was cast down to this earth before this world was created. So now we've got a little bit of timing sequence going. Doesn't Jesus say, I saw Satan fall like lightning? So whether he was cast out or fell, bottom line, he ended up here. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, how much how much that. active uh, mm -hmm. physical action was on God's part, we don't well, know. In, but Revelation 12 says cast out. So that's... that's well, you, you could probably translate it another way. Too. Yeah, probably that way too as well. I've heard... Translations are... Um, one prominent um, Adventist preacher said this 30-some uh, years ago. It was Emilio Kennedy. Uh -huh. says, this is the only place in the universe where he gave the power to recreate uh, mm -hmm. human beings. So logically, this would be the place for Satan to come to. Well, and my thought, if you, my thought on that is that if I think God has stopped creating for, for right now, and I think the reason he stopped creating is if he made a new world with any new beings, guess who would demand immediate access to them? Satan. So God says, until the great controversy is settled, I'm not going to create. But that doesn't mean he won't go back to creating after the great controversy is all over. Um, anyway. To, to, to say that Satan has demands access, I think the mere fact that the, the, you, for people to understand love, they have to understand they have the freedom to make choices. And uh, it, it could very well happen again. But then do they, how far do the, the consequences need to play out yeah. uh, in another yeah. go around? Yeah. Well, the great controversy is not going to happen again. I'm sure, quite sure of that. Well, it'd be no, how do we be sure, except for the says, no more death, yeah. if we believe that, that statement. What is it? Three times in Revelation, I yeah. think it is. Because we have to believe that intelligent beings will learn from what we have done. Yeah. Well, and let's God hope, has had let's to go through so. to, to, to extinguish sin. And those marks will always be there on his hands yeah. and on his feet. Will always, will all see. God knew, of course, that Satan would do whatever he could <laughs> to deceive, beguile, whatever, Adam and Eve. And in some way, deceive them if possible. Satan imagined, here's Ellen White suggesting again, imagine that, Carrie? If he could in any way beguile them, Adam and Eve in brackets, to disobedience, God would make some provision whereby they might be pardoned and then himself and all the formal, fallen rather angels would be in a fair way to share with them of God's mercy. That's okay. the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. Age 30, 1870s, being that far back. Yeah. Story of redemption. So think about this. What Satan's saying, he said, we've been cast out of heaven. We're in trouble out here. How can we get back to our favorite status? And he says, okay, here are these new people here. If we can get them to sin, they have a tree of life there in the Garden of Eden. We have our tree, which is just close to it. If we can somehow, well, there ought to be a way. If God's going to make a provision for them to get back, okay. we're going to claim that that should apply to us too. God, of course, knew of Satan's plans, and he warned Adam and Eve, so what was the purpose of having the tree of knowledge, good and knowledge uh, located in the Garden of Eden close to the tree of life? Does that make sense, Gordon? So Genesis 2, 16 and 17, he, that is God, said to him, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You m must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day from the Good News Bible. Okay. Do we believe that original statement in all its implications that sin leads to death as God told Adam and Eve. History kind of gives a testimony to that. What? I say history 
Sure. Well, this is a pretty good demonstration. And Romans 6, of course, says, you know, sin pays his way to death. Okay, so if that is true, are, do we think about the possibility of dying every time we commit sin? Not actively. I don't, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, shouldn't we? I mean, shouldn't we recognize it? I mean, doesn't God want us to think that? If Okay, if you choose to sin, if you choose to rebel against me and do something that you know that you shouldn't, you are cutting yourself off from the source of life, right? Is that the reason that the term that same day is there? Yeah. Um, because, I mean, if you took off that same day, you can interpret that a little broader. Mm -hmm. But... I mean, yeah. people will argue with that and say, no, I didn't die that day. Adam, and Adam and Eve didn't Adam die. Eve. Die was separation but, from God. Yeah, It's the commencement and, of death. Mm -hmm. That's right. There, and prior to that, there had been no death in the universe, that was, at least in the record of it. Well, they knew something had happened. Yeah. Well, they sure. were scared of the Creator when He came. Mm -hmm. and this is naked. Yeah. So now... The next obvious question, okay, here's the tree of life. They have to go there every day to eat from the tree of life, right? right? Why does God put the tree of knowledge very near, in the center of the garden? Oh, that tree? Okay, no, we're going to go to this one. Uh, which tree? Oh, oh, this one. <laughs> this is the one. Well, not that one, this one. Shouldn't God have put it off somewhere in the yeah. far corner where they would have never have found it? They would have found so it Satan, eventually, so... Satan could not have any... Excuse. Chasing them around. Yeah, well, you know, come on. You put this thing so far away. You really want to yeah. find out? Like Job, you see? No, put it side by side. Then let's see what happens. Okay. Myra, you get to give us the answer here. Yeah. From Ellen G. White, the tree of knowledge had been made a test of their obedience and of their love to God. The Lord had seen fit to lay upon them but one prohibition as to the use of all that was in the garden. But if they should disregard his, his will in this particular, they would incur the guilt of transgression. Satan was not to follow them with continual temptations. He could have, he could have access to them only at the forbidden tree. Should they attempt to investigate its nature, they would have exposed his wiles. They would be exposed. They would be ex exposed, excuse me, to his wiles. They were admonished to give careful heed to the warning which God had sent them, had sent them, and to be content with the instruction which he had seen fit to impart. That's from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53. Okay, now this is a, this is a statement that I think very few, even pastors, have read and, 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 and thought about. Because what's it saying? Think about it. Suppose God says, here's this fabulous garden. I'm giving you the whole thing. I'm asking just one thing. Stay away from that tree. I mean, there were thousands of trees, I'm sure, with fruits every kind that you can possibly imagine, and all sorts of wonderful things to eat, and so forth. God says, please, stay away from this tree. Was that? Say please. <laughs> he didn't say please. There's no record that he said please. No, Let's okay. Put it that way. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, he says, eat of this, and you're going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, some years ago, uh, Bob Meloshenko did a series on the, called The Science of Sin and Salvation. And it's, it's something that sticks out in my memory about it. If a person engages in something that they have an idea that it is not r good to do, and they th they, they think they're going to get away with it. There's something about human nature, at least among some people with human nature. And once you get, if you get away with it, think you got away with it, it reinforces that, that type of behavior down. It's similar to winning the lottery. The worst thing you can do is to win the lottery, because if you do, you're going to continue to chase like the rabbit in a greyhound track. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's human psychology. Well, the point here is that Satan was not allowed to follow them 
everywhere they went, all around the garden, behind every tree, behind every bush, da 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 No, he was limited to that one tree. So in this one paragraph in Ellen White, she says, quote, had been made a test of their obedience, mm -hmm. is the tree of knowledge. And then later she Im strongly implies that it was a protection mm -hmm. for them, that Satan could only be at that one tree. So which was it? Both. Oh, it was only a test if they approached the tree. If they stayed away from tre the tree, it was a protection. So the, different, the choice was with them. If they stayed away from the tree, it was a protection. If they approached the tree, it was a test. And having approached the tree with, with Eve, the two st basic statements that the serpents uh, uttered were they lies. Mm -hmm. Because one, you're not going to die. The other one was, you'll be like God knowing, or the gods knowing good from evil. Those were really basically t were true, uh, true statements. Mm -hmm. But they were deceptive because on the part of s the words of Satan or the serpent, uh, it apparently had no experience with death. Well, and let's, let's think about that. As far as we know, nobody in the entire universe had died right. up to that point. Exactly. Okay. So They hadn't even had a leaf fall off the tree. No. You, you've heard a statement that says, past performance is no guarantee of future results. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's where it was at. But in God in his foreknowledge mm -hmm. knew what was coming down the pike for him. Okay, now we as right. Seventh-day Adventists, go ahead. Well, we look at this Monday morning quarterbacking. Right, yeah. Because we can see the results of what happened. But for Adam and Eve, they had to process what it meant to not go near that tree. And for Eve to go to that tree. So now the question I'm going to ask is, how much did God tell them? How much did the angels tell them? Yeah. He could have said... Don't go near that tree. There's going to be a snake in that tree. He's going to try to offer you the fruit. He could have done that. He didn't. But then Satan, then Lucifer would have done something different. Well, whatever he, Satan was going to do, something God could have... Something else fantastic. Huh? Something else fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so as Seventh-day Adventists, you believe that Ellen White was given all these... You saw all these things in vision? Uh what happened in heaven, then the fall, and then the, what happened here in the garden? Did she understand, is she the one who got a clear understanding of the great controversy? There's been, I, I can't name of any since the time of Paul, uh, up until today, yeah. that have had any insights that she did not have. But yeah. then, as we study though, Revelation chapter 12, Ezekiel 14, uh, Isaiah 28, is yeah, it, Ezekiel 20. Ezekiel 28. These things do come together. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and perhaps some Adventists are the only ones who dig into this. And yeah. why not? Well, we're going to say categorically the tree of knowledge was intended to be a protection for Adam and Eve. All they had to do was stay away from it. Satan was not allowed to follow them wherever they went throughout the garden. He was confined to that one tree. All they had to do to avoid trouble was... Stay away from that tree. <laughs> Was it fair to Satan and his angels to allow them to have access only to that one spot in the Garden of Eden? I mean, why, what, what did, did God owe something to Satan that he had to let him have a spot in the Garden? It's called freedom. It's called freedom. Freedom for us to choose. Freedom for us to choose. And okay. education. Okay, education, <laughs> yeah. Not the kind we need, right? Well, everybody's going to is going to have be educated, and what do you think we're going to spend a thousand years? Yeah, uh, there's that's a lot of more education because nobody that that has died or will yet die is going to go to heaven with uh, everything all sorted out. No, that I'm sure of. You so, ever have things all sorted out? No. <laughs> Was it fair to Adam and Eve having that one tree there located close to the tree of life? All they had to do was stay away from it. Well, after having my six grandchildren this past week, mm -hmm. um, it, it's almost, you tell them to stay away, 
it's a magnet. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, I, I want to see what it is. Why she says that? Why there must be why something. Grandpa? Yeah. Why grandma? I, I have two granddaughters in my house right now, so I understand that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've already talked about the fact that without freedom, there can be no love. So. Why do we choose to follow God's advice given thousands of years ago instead of following the accepted beliefs of our current generation? Is that a foolish thing to do? I mean, most Christians in our world today choose to believe Satan's first lie instead of believing God's repeated statements. So why do we say, no, we're not going to go that way. We're going to go with God's statements. What was Satan's first lie? You won't. God, God is a liar. God is a liar, you know. And then you won't die. You will, you will you, but why sure. would that entice us to say God is a liar? I mean, but, but to you give can't us. trust him. Uh, you can't trust him or yeah. that I have enough ability to think on my own. I don't need to rely on God to tell me what's best for me. That's a possibility. Another possibility that I think is probably a significant factor, we don't want to believe that our friends or our family members who have died are really gone, gone. We, we like, to, I mean, people would like to believe, yeah, they're somewhere. They may, we may not be able to see them or hear them, but they're somewhere. And, well, and, Jesus, it was during his time. He says, Lazarus is sleeping. Yeah. Well, if he's sleeping, he's going to wake up. Yep. Well, no, he, he, Jesus says, yeah, he really is dead. Yeah. Later. Yeah. <laughs> but, but <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, as we know the story, Eve separated from Adam, wandered close to that tree. No doubt well, she was surprised to find the serpent, which was considered to be one of the wisest of the creatures, hanging in the tree of knowledge and eating of the forbidden fruit. What was he doing there? Looking up at the tree, he began to ask, and this is, of course, ideas that we've gotten from Ellen White. Looking up at the tree, he began to ask herself about God's restrictions. Hmm, why did he tell us this? Why did he, why did he, why did he? She wondered why God had given the warning that he did. Suddenly, she heard a voice, a strange voice that she had never heard before addressing her. Charles? This is from Ellen White. By parting of this tree, he declared they would attain to a more exalted sphere of experience, of existence, existence and yeah. enter a broader field of knowledge. He himself had eaten of the forbidden fruit and as a result had acquired the power of speech. The, she got mesmerized. Yeah. Um, and he insinuated that the Lord's jealousy desired to withhold it from them, lest they should be exalted and equality with himself. Now, who is it that wanted to be exalted to equality with God? Lucifer. Lucifer, <laughs> Lucifer <laughs> Satan himself. So he said, well, now he's trying to do this to you too. <laughs> it was because of the wonderful properties imparting wisdom and power that he had prohibited them from testing or even touching it. The tempter intimated that the divine warning was not to be actually fulfilled. It was designed merely to intimidate them. How In, could it intimidate? Yes. How could it ever be possible for them to die? Had they not eaten of the tree of life? God had been seeking to prevent them from reaching a nobler development and finding greater happiness. <laughs> okay, well, we know this. <laughs> they were not happy. Enough. Yeah. Because <laughs> they had greater happiness, happier. How could you be happier than what they already were? That's Patriarch of Prophets, page 54, paragraph 2. Genesis 3 1 2 through 4. Now, the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any of the trees in the garden? <laughs> well, we may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. 
God told us not to eat the fruit of it, that of the tree, or even touch it. If we do, we will die. And, and the snake replied, "That's not true. You will not die." And the the way that's certain, you, there's a is a very certain kind of statement in the original. You certainly will not die. And he's eating it at yeah. the same time. Now, my next question. Do you think we have the entire conversation between Satan and Eve? No. Or do we have only key parts of it? Ellen White says, first, the first thing he did was flatter her. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, there was no one besides Adam in Eden. Mm -hmm. The angels. Oh, the angels. And God. But, God. Yes, but were the angels walking around with her, talking with her? It's implied they were. Huh? Okay. Mm. Uh, but this is a new voice. This is a new voice and a cunning voice and a... You know, some places in the scriptures, she has stopped. He stopped Balaam. Hey, do you see that angel? The, yeah. the dog had to show him. Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, he stopped. Uh, he stopped uh, Saul. You yeah. cannot kick, I guess. But, but he did not. He did not stop her. Mm -hmm. He chose not to. Well, logically, from a human standpoint, there were a couple of reasons to support the serpent's claims. One, no one had died up to that point. No one on this earth had experienced sin. She was pretty sure of that. Two, the serpents appeared to be eating the fruit and claimed that it had given, given him the power of speech. Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty compelling evidence, isn't, isn't it? Well, from our Bible study guide, we have these words. Unfortunately, in deciding between the two conflicting statements, God said you will die if you eat of this fruit, and Satan said you certainly will not die, Eve ignored three basic principles. One, Human reason is not always the safest way to evaluate spiritual matters. Two, the Word of God can appear to be illogical and senseless to us, but it is always right and trustworthy. And three, there are things that are not evil or wrong in themselves, but God has chosen them as tests of obedience. So now, was this a test of obedience? We've already shown, I think, quite conclusively that this was this tree was supposed to be a protection for them. Well, how often in our day do we find challenges to God's Word coming from our culture and our surroundings? On what basis do we choose to agree with God's Word instead of what appears to be popular and true around us? Remember that our choices have eternal consequences. Can you think of ways in which the teachings of God's Word are in contrast with the ordinary thinking of people in our day. Putting God first in our thinking is completely foreign to most of the people living in our world today. For example, just a couple simple examples. To dedicate to God one-tenth of our income and one-seventh of our time never enters their minds. I mean, if you stop somebody on the street and said, uh, did you know you're supposed to be paying a tenth of your income? They would say, what? Or did you know you're supposed to be giving a, tenth, a seventh of your time to God? Huh? So in what, on what basis did he choose to eat the fruit of the tree? Jim? Genesis 3, verses 6 and 7. The woman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruit would be to eat. And she thought how wonderful it would be to become wise. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, and he also ate it. As soon as they had eaten it, they were given under, understanding and realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves. Good News Bible. Okay, now, here's a challenging question. Did God create the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Of course. Yes. Of course. Only he can create. Only he can create. Was it God's fault that it looked, looked good and it was appealing and... Uh, 
everything looked good <laughs> and everything was appealing in the garden. Yeah. Well, then Satan would have said, look, you created that ugly thing and you, you want this as your <laughs> thing of uh, allegiance to you? Come on. Yeah, it's for you know? your cactus instead. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> exactly. Okay, our Bible study guide gives some hints about all this. Carrie? First, he generalized God's specific prohibition. Now, let's, let's, let's understand what that. Satan said, the way it's worded, did God tell you that you must eat, not eat of any tree in the garden? Mm -hmm. That was the way he stated it. Okay, go ahead. He asked, has God really said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Genesis 3, 1, your new... New American Standard Bible. Thank you. Eve counter-argued that the prohibition was in regard only to that specific tree. For if they were ever to eat from it or touch it, they would die. Then Satan contradicted God's statement. He asserted categorically, you certainly will not die. Genesis 3, 4. And finally, Satan accused God of deliberately suppressing the essential knowledge from her and her husband. The deceiver argued, for God knows that on the day you eat from it, in brackets, the forbidden fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will become like God, knowing good and evil, as from Genesis 3, 5. Okay. Uh, Eve chose to use her own senses, the empirical method, personal observation to decide between the conflicting versions of truth. There's a term that was very popular maybe 30 or 40 years ago describing that way of approaching things. Can you know what it was called? Situation ethics. Situation ethics. You just think about what's right in front of you and it looks good, it seems to be, uh, it looks like it would be good to eat. Boom. Uh, well, me it comes down to, I remember being a, in school somewhere years ago and it, it, they brought out it quite simple. If you don't want the devil's wares, you don't go to his store. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. From the Bible Study Guide. First, she saw that from a dietary perspective, the tree was good for food. Second, from an aesthetic viewpoint, she saw that it was delightful to the eyes. Third, from a logical analysis, the tree was desirable to make one wise. Hence, in her own mind, she certainly had good reasons to heed the words of the serpent and to eat from the forbidden tree. Unfortunately, this is what she did. From our Bible study guide. Was it God's fault that we sinned? Didn't he make the tree with all those attractive attributes? Hmm. But someone it says... And Charles says it, he, he wouldn't be fair to make an ugly tree, right? That's very true. <laughs> but also, he says, stay together. Yeah. Stay together. Mm -hmm. Well, is there anything wrong with knowledge? Some people would suggest that all knowledge is fine. We just have to choose what is good. They even have a verse for it. First Thessalonians 5, verse 21. Choose the good. But from Adam and Eve's story, we learn that there are some things that we'd be better off not knowing. And I can think of all kinds of things today that we would be better off not knowing. What's, what is it like to have lung cancer? What is it like, I mean, <laughs> start down the list. What, what's it like to be addicted to smoking? I am so glad I have not that problem. What's it like to be an alcoholic? I'm so glad I don't know about that. How many things are there that would be good not to know? Well, let's cut, come closer to home. How about people getting addicted to sugar? Yeah. By the way, it's a very addicting thing. Yeah. More addictive than tobacco. Yes, sir. Very true. Yes. Careful what you talk about, Charles. I know. I know. <laughs> Might get stoned. <laughs> yeah. But it's true. <laughs> well, the, the, the challenge is with food, and sugar is a main, main component of virtually every food, yeah. is that you can't live without it. Well, the fructose part, if we want to be technical, you know, uh, glucose is life. You, you cannot live without glucose, but fructose... Mm. That's why the Lord gave us the fruit, not sugar. Not yeah. Anyways. After a brief conversation with Eve, Satan came to his punchline. 
then Satan contradicted God's statement. He asserted categorically, you certainly will not die from adult stubble Bible. Had anybody, I can't say that. Okay, adult Sabbath school Bible study guide. Had anyone ever lied to Eve before? No. No. Adam did not. Okay, qu question. Gordon said earlier that the angels were walking around. Were Satan's angels there? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, sure. Were they only I'm sure they were there. The tree? Yes. But whether they were allowed to speak, no. They were not to allow, They were not allowed to go anywhere except to that tree. Right. Yeah. So if you stayed away from the tree, they would not be able to approach you. But they remember also they were in the garden. Yeah. They were apparently what was outside the garden was not wasn't all that great. Yeah, they were in the they were in the garden, close to the tree of life. Yeah. Yeah. Were they like the guys on the corner, yelling and saying, "Hey, God says." <laughs> I don't know. I will bet that there was not a mob of evil angels visible around the tree. No. They would know something. there's something wrong with that crowd. It, yep. was, it was subtle. Right. Ellen White s says specifically, if uh, a, an, in a person, something like an angel, a person approached the, her, she would have been afraid and fled. But Charles, snake, well, it, it, yeah, it, it, really, it, snake. It, 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 it was probably good, you know, pretty, well, pretty colors yeah. and so forth. Maybe even flu. And yeah. then it's eating. Yeah, yeah. The very it's, thing it's, that you're not supposed to touch. Wait a minute. Yeah. Okay. Can you think of some ways in which Satan's lie is still believed in our world today? That's one we're going to think about. I want you to ask, you to ask yourself, what ways? Do we know clearly that people in our world today are still believing Satan's lies? One of the biggest ones is that you don't die. Yes. Well, and that's where you get the, the teaching of hell. All the of the Christians, of the yeah. yes, all of the Christians, except for yeah. Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah. Some well, Seventh-day Adventists. Um, Jehovah's Witness somewhat subscribed like A little bit, yeah. Adventist. But, okay. Uh, it, Charles, you want to... Yes. One powerful manifestation of the lie is seen in common belief in the immortality of the soul. This notion was the basis of many ancient religions and philosophies. In ancient Egypt, it motivated the uh, mummification pra uh, practices and the funerary architecture, such as that seen in the pyramids. Let me interrupt for just a second. Um, there's a whole museum in New York that we visited not too long ago. My wife and I, we were there visiting our children. And they have a whole bunch of these things. All the Egyptians made, they made models of all these things. And the models are still preserved. They're there, you can see them. What you do, what happens to you when you die, how you get put in this boat and you get carried across this da 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 da. I mean, so the museum had made models of, of no, the No, they, they had Egyptians. models. They had models that the Egyptians had made. Oh. Yes, and the other is at the St. Peter's itself. Yeah. It's amazing how much they have in there. Careful. <laughs> okay, Charles? <laughs> All right, yes. Uh, the notion was the basis of many, okay, right. The theory also became one of the main pillars of Greek philosophy. For example, the Republic of Plato, Socrates asked Glaucon, are you not aware that our soul is immortal and never perishes? Um, what are we? In Plato. Plato is Plato. Yeah. Mine, mine. Socrates okay. argued, I'll, I'll pick it up there. Okay. Uh, in Plato's Phaedo, Socrates argued in a, temp in a similar tone, saying that, quote, the soul is immortal and ir imperishable, and our souls really will exist in Hades, close quote. These philosophical concepts would shape much of the Western culture and even post-apostolic Christianity, but they originated much earlier in the Garden of Eden with Satan himself. 
At the core of the Edenic temptation, Satan assured Eve, you certainly will not die. With the, and that's, of course, Genesis 3, 4. With this emphatic assertion, Satan put his own word above the word of God and in direct conflict with the word of God from our Bible study guide. And he has done very well all yeah. over Christian world. So what is the truth? And elsewhere. And elsewhere. What is the truth? Is it based on God's holy word? Is the soul naturally immortal or not? Why do you choose to believe that say that it is not? Well, well, why did we go to the most favorite text for many Christians all over the world? Genesis, I mean, uh, John 3.16. Yeah. The Lord himself is saying, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. So how do you not perish? Believe in him should mm -hmm. not perish, but have everlasting life. Yep. So everlasting life is in Christ and Christ alone. John 17, 3, eternal life yeah. is to know the this Father. Is, this is life eternal, that yeah. they might know the only true God. And it doesn't say somebody okay. come along and pay up for you, pay your right. uh, penalty. Uh, it's not there. It's, it's all made up. Some verses here, from starting from Psalm 115. Who can do that for us? Psalm 115, verse 17, the Lord is not praised by the dead, by any who go down to the end of silence. The land of silence. The land of silence, I'm sorry. Okay. John 5, 28 and 29, Jesus said, Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice and come out from the graves. Those who have done good will rise and live, and those who have done evil will rise and be condemned. Psalms 146, verse 4. Okay, so let me just interrupt. We've been talking about how does our understanding of the state of the dead impact other things we believe? If everybody has already gone to heaven or hell... You don't need a resurrection. Why do you need a resurrection? Okay, go ahead. Psalms 146, verse 4. When they die, they return to the dust, and on that day all their plans come to an end. And then Matthew 28, excuse me, Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of God, who can destroy both the body and soul in hell. That's and then one more. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 58. Listen to this, this secret truth. We shall not all die, but when the last trumpet sounds, we shall all be changed in an instant, as quickly as the blinking of an eye. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised, never to die again and we shall all be changed, for what is mortal must be changed into what is immortal. What will die must be changed into what cannot die. So when this takes place, and all the mortal has been changed into immortal, into the immortal, then the scripture will come true. Death is destroyed, victory is complete. Where death is your victory, where Death is your power to hurt. Death gets its way to hurt from sin. It's power. It's power to hurt from sin, and sin gets its power from the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and steady. Keep busy always in your work for the Lord, since you know that nothing you do in the Lord's service is ever useless from the Good News Bible. Our world today is permeated with books and movies and even scientific investigations supporting that human beings are somehow alive after they die. A scientific group is investigating what they call PMPs. Have you heard of PMPs? Post-material persons. Post-material persons. Read again the familiar story in Genesis 3, 7 to 19, and we don't have time to do that right now, but you know the story of God's discussion with Adam and Eve. You're dust and you're gonna go back to dust, right? And notice what the consequences were of that original sin. It certainly is true that Eve had no idea how substantial and important the consequences of her seemingly simple act would be. In effect, she switched her allegiance from trusting God explicitly to believing Satan's lies and she transferred her, transferred her trust to the serpent. And what, was the con what were the consequences? 
immediately they lost their covering of light and became afraid of God. Theophobia. They were cast out of the garden because it was no longer safe for them to stay there lest they eat of the tree of life. They would experience sweat, feel pain, and eventually die. Genesis 3:16 to 19. Furthermore, the natural world would, be deter would deteriorate. So she adds, as they witnessed in drooping flower and falling leaf the first signs of decay, Adam and his companion mourned more deeply than men now more, mourn rather, over their dead. The death of the frail, delicate flowers was indeed a cause of sorrow. But when the goodly trees cast off their leaves, the scene brought vividly to mind the stern fact that the death is the portion of every living thing. The Garden of Eden remained upon the earth long after man had become an outcast from its pleasant paths. The fallen race were long permitted to gaze upon the home of innocence, their entrance barred only by the watching angels. At the cherubim guarded gate of paradise, the divine glory was revealed. Hither came Adam and his sons to worship God. Here they renewed their vows of obedience to that law, the transgression of which had banished them from Eden. When the tide of iniquity overspread the world and the wickedness of men determined their destruction by a flood of waters, the hand that had planted Eden withdrew it from the earth. But in the final restitution, when there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, it's Revelation 21.1, it is to be restored more gloriously adorned than at the beginning. Then they that have kept God's commandments shall breathe in immortal vigor beneath the tree of life and through unending ages the inhabitants of sinful, sinless words, no worlds they're supposed to be, shall behold in that garden of delight a sample of the perfect word work of God's creation, untouched by the curse of sin, a sample of what the whole earth would have become had man fulfilled the Creator's glorious plan. Wow. It's from Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, 62, 1 to 3. So the whole earth could have been turned into Garden of Eden, and it will. Yeah. It will happen. So as humans had children and they expanded, the garden could expand. Well, and think about it. How big a garden would it take if you had perfectly reproducing plants to feed two people? Mm -hmm. One tree. <laughs> Just about. Half a tree. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, their sinful condition has spread to all their offspring, including us. And we're running out of time here. Are we condemned because Adam sinned and we inherited sinful nature from him? or because we sin ourselves? Probably both. Both? Well, there's certain, set, certain aspects. You probably know that this is a theological discussion that goes on and on, and this has been discussed for eons. Shouldn't we learn from Eve's, Eve's experience that in many cases it is still true that the consequences of our sins turn out to be much more serious than, the, than we had at first observed or first perceived? There's one great light and hope in the middle of Genesis 3, and that's Genesis 3.15. The Lord said, I will make you and the woman hate each other. That's talking to uh, the serpent. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head, and you will bite her offspring's heel. Good News Bible, Genesis 3.15. And I'm sure that Myra would agree that there has been enmity between women and snakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do you understand the words of Genesis 3.15? Do you think Adam and Eve understood what God was saying to them? No. They were pretty smart. Yeah, they were. And God, they had God to explain it. I'm sure they didn't begin to comprehend everything that was involved. But how about how about the fig leaves? He yeah. took them out and he slaughtered a couple of sheep there and they never seen death before. Yeah. Despite the terrible situation that they found themselves in, they could look forward to the promise of God that there would be a solution. 
Is it still true, as God said to the serpent, that is to Satan, that there is a natural enmity between us and evil? I wish there were more enmity between us and evil. Ephesians 2 and Romans 6 tell us about that. I don't have time to read those right now. The Lord next used an animal sacrifice to illustrate the messianic promise. And again, we, well, when Adam, according to God's special directions, made an offering for sin, it was to him a most painful ceremony. His hand must be raised to take life which God alone could give and make an offering for sin. It was the first time he had witnessed death as he looked upon the bleeding victim within writhing in the agonies of death. He was to look forward by faith to the Son of God whom the vic victim prefigured who was to die man's sacrifice. Story of Redemption, page 50. Of course, that's Ellen White. Uh, if you'd like to read and consider some of the other questions we didn't get a chance to talk about, you can get that experience by turning to our website at theox.org, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. As far as we know, up to that point in time, no one in the entire universe had died. They did not know what death meant. So God needed to give them a very blunt and meaningful ceremony to represent that truth. Of course, we now recognize that that lamb was to represent the future sacrifice of Christ himself. If he succeeded in causing Adam and Eve to sin, what did Satan plan to do immediately after that? And uh, I'll just read part of it as we have time. He, his, Satan's followers were seeking him, and he aroused himself and assumed a look of defiance, informing them of his plans to wrest from God the noble Adam and his companion Eve. If he could in any way beguile them to disobedience, he would, God would make some provision whereby they might be pardoned and then himself and all the fallen angels would be in a fair way to share with them of God's mercy. If this should fail, they could unite with Adam and Eve for when once they should transgress the law of God, they would be subjects of God's wrath like themselves. This is Satan's argument. Their transgression would place them also in a state of rebellion and they could unite with Adam and Eve um, take possession of Eden and hold it as their home. Think about that. And if they could gain access to the tree of life in the midst of the garden, their strength would be, they thought, be equal to that of the holy angels and even God himself could not expel them. So think of it, Satan's plan here was to take control of the garden of Eden. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, as we delve more deeply into some of these issues connected with these early stories in the Bible, we see some amazing things. We see that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was intended to be a protection for Adam and Eve. And then, believe it or not, Satan thought that once he got Adam and Eve to sin, he might somehow control the Garden of Eden and even have access to the tree of life and make himself and all sinners live forever. Wow. We thank you for these insights and we ask that you will guide us as we discuss together on future occasions other information and other implications from these facts is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.